Justin Brierly, host of the Unbelievable podcast and YouTube channel, would like to explain why, after 10 years of talking with atheists, he is still a Christian. Unfortunately, despite all his time spent talking to atheists, he doesn't seem to have spent much time listening. Justin Brierly recently gave a talk and published a book about why he's still a Christian even after 10 years of hosting his show. In this video, I'm only going to review his 30-minute talk, and this is for several reasons. Number one is I just don't have time for a full book review. Number two is because I think more people will frankly watch his talk than will read his book. And number three, because Justin seems to think that this talk of his can stand on its own merits. He doesn't give a disclaimer that he's merely summarizing his book, and he even made the same basic arguments just a few months later in his debate with Stephen Woodford. So I think it's fair for me to respond to only his talk, with some supplemental information where necessary. Now, I have a great deal of respect for what Justin is doing, and I think he does a very good job of facilitating the types of conversations he sets out to create. But, it seems to me that, for all his time spent talking to atheists, Justin has no better understanding of the atheist position than any other apologist. When I decided to watch Justin's talk, I of course expected to disagree with his conclusions, but I also expected him to be able to at least articulate his opponent's arguments and to understand how these types of discussions are supposed to be conducted. Unfortunately, this does not appear to be the case, and I'd like to explain why I think this. The first ten minutes of Justin's talk are about the history and goal of his show, which, as I said, I respect and have no issues with, so I'm just going to skip ahead to his arguments. Very often what we're doing when we're speaking to skeptics is we're making a defense of our faith. We're showing them why we believe what we believe. And over the years, it struck me that sometimes many Christians feel like all of the onus is on them, that they have to bear the burden of all the proof and all the evidence. But actually, I don't think it's like that. I think actually everyone has a point of view. Everyone has what you might call a worldview. The atheist, the person who doesn't believe in God, they've also got a worldview, okay? And it's a worldview that they need to defend and justify as well. This is already a red flag, shifting the burden of proof. As I explained in my video, What is Atheism? An atheist could argue that there are no God beings at all, but this position is very hard to defend against every possible God claim. This is why, in my experience, and likely in Justin's as well, most people who call themselves atheists don't actually claim this kind of universal knowledge. Most atheists believe the much more defensible proposition that there is simply not enough evidence to justify belief in any sort of god beings, even though such beings could plausibly exist. This position, in and of itself, does not have a burden of proof except to respond to any proposed evidence to its contrary. As an example of how this works, consider the claim that there is a secret robot war going on all around us, which we haven't noticed because the robot soldiers can all transform into common machines like trucks and airplanes, hiding in plain sight, robots in disguise. Now, presumably, as you sit here watching this video, you don't believe this claim, but... Do you have any evidence to justify your disbelief? Can you prove that there is no secret robot war going on? No, of course not. And yet, you don't believe that these robot soldiers exist. Nor should you. This kind of non-belief is the null hypothesis, and it does not have an initial burden of proof. This is something I explained in detail in my video, What is the Burden of Proof? At the start of the conversation, the burden of proof is on the person proposing that Transformers, or God, exists. However, as soon as someone does present evidence of Transformers, or God, that is when the burden shifts. Maybe they show you a convincing video of a truck transforming into a robot with arms and legs, and then they show you some massive footprints at the location where the video was taken. 
At this point, the burden of proof for Transformers has supposedly been met, and now it is the skeptic's burden to show that the evidence is still not good enough, if he can. But if no evidence has been presented, then the null hypothesis stands, and it is reasonable to not believe that Transformers, or God, exist. And if a Christian theist, or a Transformer believer, demands that I prove my belief that the evidence is not good enough, well, okay, I can't read your mind, what evidence do you think is good enough that I should address? That is the only way the conversation can begin, with the burden of proof on the theist. This is why Justin's framing of the conversation should raise a red flag. His assertion that both sides have an initial burden of proof incorrectly reframes the conversation in his favor, shifting some of his burden onto his opponent. He is essentially arguing that anyone who doesn't believe in God, Transformers, or five-legged aliens with blue horns and silver wings needs to defend their worldview in which these things do not exist, which is clearly a flawed approach. This is a very basic feature of these types of conversations, so the fact that Justin seems to be unaware of this very basic point is, frankly, surprising and concerning. Anyway, this has been a long dissection of a small comment from Justin, but I assure you, there's more. The person who doesn't believe in God, they've also got a worldview, okay, and it's a worldview that they need to defend and justify as well. Because many of the atheists I meet hold to something that's sometimes called naturalism or materialism. And it's the view that there is no God, and all that exists is energy and matter and the laws of nature. That's all there is, ultimately. Now, that's an interesting worldview, but you need to defend it. If that's the way you think reality is, then I'm going to ask you a few hard questions about that. So you see, it's not that the Christian has to do all the defending and all the proving things, it's that we've both got a worldview. The thing is, Justin, being an atheist does not require that you are also a naturalist. You can be an atheist who believes in karma, auras, substance dualism, or any number of supernatural things, so long as none of these things is some kind of god. Atheists don't need to defend naturalism in order to be atheists. All they need to defend is the proposition that the evidence for the god in question is not good enough. The fact that many atheists also happen to be naturalists is unsurprising, but it's not actually critical to their atheism. Even if naturalism was proven false, you could still easily be an atheist. Incidentally, I and many other self-described atheists will typically hold to what you might call provisional naturalism, on the basis of what seems to be a profound lack of evidence for every supernatural claim we've encountered. This is not the only way to be an atheist, but it seems to be the most common way in my experience. This is important because this type of provisional naturalism is basically just the null hypothesis. The Christian and the atheist both agree that at least matter and energy and space-time exist, so the question is, what evidence is there that anything more exists? Specifically, that some kind of God-being exists. This is where the burden of proof lies. Atheists do not need to defend naturalism in order to be atheists. Christians need to defend their particular brand of theism in order to be Christians. I'd also like to comment on Justin's claim that atheists need to defend naturalism in light of the title of his talk, Why, After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists, I'm Still a Christian. He seems to be suggesting that he is still a Christian because atheists haven't proven naturalism which is ridiculous because for Justin to have stopped being a Christian, he wouldn't have had to become a full-on naturalist. The only thing it would take for him to stop being a Christian would be for him to be convinced that the evidence for Christianity specifically is not actually good after all, or that Christianity specifically has some serious problems that override the evidence he thinks counts in its favor. Neither of these things would require him to become a full-on naturalist. He could still be a theist, just not a Christian theist. Atheists don't have to prove naturalism in order for Justin to stop being a Christian. 
In my opinion, this is a sneaky way for Justin to try and shift the burden of proof in order to reassure his Christian audience, or possibly just himself, that even after 10 years of trying, the atheists still haven't met their burden of disproving Christianity. They have sent their armies to destroy us. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Now, Justin does go on to provide some reasons why he thinks Christianity is true, so credit to him for not just leaving it at atheists haven't proven naturalism, but I think his framing up to this point has either been disingenuous or simply ignorant. They've got one way of seeing the world, and the Christian has another way of seeing the world. And the question is, which one is true? And which one fits the evidence that we actually see? And in my experience, I've found that the Christian worldview wins out every time. I think it's the most compelling story we have for what we see around us. Here's a few reasons why I think Christianity is the best explanation of the way we see the world. Justin is going to explain why he thinks Christianity is the best explanation for three things. Human existence, human value, and human purpose. But we need to be very careful when we talk about something being the best explanation, because we need to first understand what makes an explanation good in the first place. Technically speaking, you can explain anything, and you can make the explanation fit the facts with 100% accuracy. Why is the Earth round? Well, because magical pixies wanted it that way, and they had the power to make it that way. Perfectly explained. Why do humans sweat to regulate body temperature? Well, because the magical pixies thought it would be cool. Pun intended. Perfectly explained. Now, are magical pixies a good explanation for these things? No? Well, why not? They make sense of literally everything we observe. So why aren't magical pixies a good explanation? In general, a good explanation is one which uses the smallest number of postulates to explain the largest number of facts. This is why magical pixies are a bad explanation. Sure, magical pixies can explain every fact we observe, but they require a new ad hoc postulate for each fact they explain. Whatever it is, the magical pixies just wanted that thing to be that way. Why? They just did. It's easy to explain things, but it's much harder to explain things in a way that doesn't require a new postulate for every fact and every anomaly. The problem in these kinds of discussions is that people often disagree about what counts as one postulate. Most Christians will want to argue that God is just one postulate that explains literally everything, which makes it the best explanation ever. But I would strongly push back on this idea, just as I would push back on the idea that magical pixies are just one postulate. Christians are not simply postulating that a god exists, they are also postulating that it has very specific desires and goals, which are often introduced in a seemingly ad hoc way. This god doesn't just exist, but it also wanted to create other minds, specifically embodied minds, and then it wanted to judge them by a set of rules for some reason, and then it also wanted to modify those rules by sacrificing itself to itself, and, well, I could go on. Suffice it to say, it's going to be hard to agree on exactly how ad hoc Christianity is, and how many novel postulates it introduces. So I think a better approach is simply to highlight a common symptom of bad explanations, which is related to ad hocness and the overall number of novel postulates, which I'm going to call flexibility. Specifically, too much flexibility. At its core, Magical Pixies is a bad explanation because it is too... flexible. Because you can so easily invent ad hoc reasons to make it fit any data set. This not only means that the explanation has zero practical applications, putting no constraints on what we should expect to see in the world, but it also means that the explanation will always seem to be true, even if it's actually false. Which is a bad thing. 
While falsifiability may no longer be the gold standard in the philosophy of science, it seems to me that a lack of falsifiability, that is, unlimited flexibility, is still a fairly universal symptom of bad explanations in general, which rely on too many novel postulates, and for which novel postulates can be so easily introduced in a completely ad hoc manner. This is why flat earthers, treasure hunting scammers, practitioners of dowsing, and 9 11 truthers talk the way they do. It's because they've made their beliefs completely unfalsifiable and infinitely flexible. There's literally nothing they cannot seamlessly fit into their model of reality, which only makes them seem all the more crazy as they rationalize their explanations in this way. If I can't find water with my dowsing rods, then clearly the spirit sensed your mischievous goal of testing the process and fled. If Joseph Smith told you to perform a ritual to ward off the treasure-guarding spirits, but then you dug and couldn't find the treasure, then you must have done the ritual wrong. If we discover footage from inside American Airlines Flight 11, which shows the now-deceased passengers in a panic, then clearly the government faked the footage to throw us off, and the conspiracy is that much larger than we originally thought. This doesn't make the 9-11 conspiracy a good explanation, it makes it a bad explanation. This doesn't make Treasure Guardians a good explanation, it makes them a bad explanation. And this doesn't make Water-Seeking Spirits a good explanation, it makes them a bad explanation. This is also why God is a bad explanation. It is infinitely flexible, to the point where it can explain anything its proponents want it to. And you say you can guarantee me the Oscar? I can guarantee you anything you want! In fact, I'd like to briefly play a section from an episode of Bad Apologetics from Digital Gnosis about the fine-tuning argument and how God is said to be the best explanation for why the universe appears to be fine-tuned for life, even though it contains virtually zero life. Like, he just literally answered that way. So if, there, if there's no um, life, then God just prefers it that way. And if there is life, then it's fine-tuned for it. So, yeah, yeah there's nothing it's equally you can do. conferred by any possible outcome. <laughs> any outcome, there's, you could concoct a reason for it that, you know, is untestable and we don't have evidence for or against, it would seem. Um, and, and this is why, fundamentally, I think theism is a bad explanation. And, and all attempts to use it as an inference to best explanation don't work. The point is, I expect the theist to have a response to every single thing that I ever say against their viewpoint the problem is not that there's no response the problem is that they're all ad hoc there's no reason to think that any of them are true more than the contrary or any other possibility god resurrects jesus he doesn't resurrect jesus he creates the universe he doesn't create the universe he finds Jesus. he doesn't find it. lots of black holes not many black holes uh lots of suffering not much suffering you know it, literally any permutation it's all could have a reason for it could want it could not want it and that's the pro that's why the hypothesis is bad it's not bad because you can't come up with a reason. It's bad because you can so easily come up with reasons and there's no constraints on them. That makes a bad hypothesis. This is why God is a bad explanation. No matter what we discover about reality, a committed Christian could just say, well, I guess God just wanted it that way. Who are we to judge God? This kind of infinite flexibility, the ability to just add new postulates for every anomaly, is what makes God and magical pixies and treasure-guarding spirits a bad explanation. In contrast, while a good explanation should be at least somewhat flexible to accommodate some new data, it should also be rigid enough that it could potentially be contradicted by new data. Modern scientific theories do this incredibly well, being flexible enough to accommodate some unexpected data but also rigid and specific enough that they can actually be used to predict new data, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. This is why scientific theories are some of the best explanations we've ever come up with. Now, on top of everything I've just said about the quality of an explanation, I'd also like to point out that just because an explanation might be the only one on the table, that doesn't make it likely to be true or rational to accept. If the available data which we consider to be valid doesn't clearly suggest any particular explanation, and if the data doesn't suggest multiple contradictory explanations, then it is perfectly rational to simply conclude, I don't know how to explain this. This is something I explained in detail in my video, Nature of the Gaps. 
Even if we can't explain something using our existing understanding of the world, that does not prove that some kind of invisible, supernatural mind must be the cause. If we lived in ancient Rome, for example, before we understood lightning, and someone proposed Zeus as the cause of lightning, the mere fact that we couldn't explain it otherwise would not mean that it's rational to believe in Zeus. An unopposed explanation does not automatically become a good explanation. The next thing I want to mention is how oddly specific Justin Brierley's list of things to be explained actually is. Human existence, human value, and human purpose. This list sounds a lot like what I talked about in my video, Questions Your Worldview Must Answer, wherein I observed that the things which are most in need of explaining, according to Christians, just so happen to be the things that Christianity sets itself up to explain. And this isn't even unique to Christianity. The questions which religious people of all faiths claim are most in need of answers just so happen to be the questions that their particular religion answers. They draw a bullseye around their arrow. This is what I think Justin has unintentionally done as he argues that Christianity is the best explanation for human existence, human value, and human purpose. And finally, I think it's worth pointing out that two of Justin's three things to be explained are potentially question-begging. We can all agree that humans exist, that's not a problem, but as for human value and human purpose, well, that's where things get tricky. It's certainly true that humans value other humans, and that humans assign purposes to themselves and others, but it's not at all clear that these things exist beyond our own human appraisal as objectively real things, which are in need of some greater explanation. I think that Justin is presuming these things exist apart from human appraisal because of his belief in Christianity, which he's trying to justify by using these things in the first place. This, ladies and gentlemen, is question begging, but we'll examine this later in the series. That's all I have to say for the beginning of Justin's talk. Make sure to subscribe and enable notifications so you don't miss part two, which will be about why Justin thinks God is the best explanation for human existence.